Ricky, what's up, brother? Thanks for joining me on the podcast. So glad to be here. Glad to be here. Let's talk. Yeah, we've we've tried it three or four times now. We've had technical. Di- I say we. It's not we. It's me. It's it's not anything to do with you at all. It's all on my side. Well, we'll get through it. We're here now. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm really excited to be talking with you. I uh, I actually grew up watching you on on on, uh, on the screen, and to be able to chat with you and have a conversation is kind of a cool thing. And my kids. Uh, you know, the, the biggest one, and I'm sure you hear this all the time for, for us and my kids have seen this now is, is Lonesome Dove, man. That, that's just a classic. Yeah. Lonesome Dove. It's a lot of people love that Western and it's probably one of the finest Westerns made. I you think know, so. Yeah. Characters, Tell- everything came together perfectly when we made Lonesome Dove. I turned 18 making Lonesome Dove. I was 17. Oh, was is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Tell me about your, uh, your path into acting? I mean, is this something that when you grew up, you always wanted to do? Did your folks get you involved with it? Like, how did that actually pan out? Because you're a, you're a childhood actor. So this is, this, is, uh, this is something that doesn't always go well, you know, based on what some of us have seen. I'm actually an asset, not an actor, Ryan. Mm. And Explain that to me. Um, so, well... It's a long story. You got time? I do. We got all the time in the world. Well, where to begin? I guess it it began, you know, having a lot of memories about the childhood when they brought me Hunter Biden's laptop um, in uh, November of 2020. A guy came to my house and he wanted to talk and so we sat down for like four hours and he went through the voting fraud data on the Smartmatic elect- uh, electronic machines and it showed that there were six million votes that had been changed predominantly from Iran, Russia and uh, China. And uh, he had a whole bunch of Hunter Biden uh, files and, and he left me with a bunch of the contracts of Hunter's and you know, I started posting some of those um, CEFC contracts that Hunter had um, a couple years ago and you know at first I wondered why they brought me this why did they bring me Hunter Biden's info and share this all with me but I started sort of having some memories um, from childhood younger childhood Um, and there was a memory of a man uh, he would put headphones on me and he and I would be in a room together just just the two of us and it was it was somebody my father played tennis with and I remembered, you know, my dad, because I grew up on the tennis courts in Staten Island, New York, every Saturday from 9 to 12, I'd go play tennis at St. Joseph's by the Sea. And then at some point, I'd be taken to a classroom at the high school, a Catholic high school next door, and, and have headphones put on me and a tape recorder put in front of me. And I, I couldn't place the memories. I didn't know what, what they were. And so I went to my folks and I said, folks, I have a memory of somebody dad played tennis with. And my dad worked at IBM and uh, AT&T later. And um, I said, Mom, Dad, I have this memory of somebody dad plays tennis with, and he's putting headphones on me and a tape recorder. Do you have any idea what it was? And they didn't know. And so I went to my sister, and she said that the same thing had happened to her with the man. And his name was John Talvey, T-O-L-V-E. And so I went back to my folks, and I said, Dawn remembers, you know, the same situation. Do you, and who is John Talvey? And my dad's like, well, John's a NYPD detective, and he was a tennis partner of mine. And uh, John had passed away in 2019, so there was no way for me to reach out to him directly. But they didn't have any idea why there would be headphones and tape recorders and things like that. Um, and uh, I remember there was other kids in the program. There was other, 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 this is before The Champ, um, before I was given that movie, The Champ, when I was uh, seven years old. So this is when I was five years old, six years old. Um, but there was other kids involved in whatever this program was. And there was a, a whole bunch of young families that all were pushing their children to, um, into the entertainment industry. And they, John, um, 
what's his name, uh, Kelly, Greg Kelly on Newsmax. He and I actually modeled together in New York back um, when we were children. His father was the police commissioner of New York City and a really good one. And so there was a whole group of um, adults that were pushing their children into the entertainment uh, fields um, to become become movie, movie stars, I guess, and TV stars. And, and none of that sort of came back to me until after they brought me Hunter Biden's laptop. And so once they brought me that, I started having these memories from my childhood. And then they gave me the movie The Champ when I was seven years old. And um, uh, so I see myself, uh, you know, I never really fit into Hollywood. I was never kind of in their, their club. I was in a, it seemed like a, an outsider. Um, but there was elements within Hollywood that were pushing me and giving me jobs and, and trying to, you know, to create, I think, counter-programming. You know, I met Ronald Reagan when I was, uh, I think, about 10 or 11 years old the first time, and I met him three times with my father. And, um, you know, from what I understand, you know, it was probably his program. It was sort of a counter-programming um, effort because he saw the way that propaganda was getting pushed into America. And um, I think there was a, a law change back then that actually allowed for propaganda to be pushed into America underneath his stewardship. And so this seems to me like it was a, a counter-programming effort um, to build assets and put them in Hollywood or put them in sports or put them in music. And I was just a seed that they kind of planted there. And then when they brought me the Hunter Biden stuff, it sort of triggered uh, what, what it really was about and the whole design of it. What, what do you think that when you say counter-programming, what exactly do you mean? What, what was it that they were trying to program or counter-program as, as you say it? Well, I mean, look at the disastrous effects of propaganda in our nation, um, you, you know, and so, you know, the roles that they would give me, they would give me, you know, the Lost Battalion, where I played Major Charles Whittlesley, a World, World War I um, Medal of Honor recipient. Um, Too Young the Hero, when I was 16, uh, about, about the youngest, uh, youngest man to serve in the Navy during World War II. He was 12 years old. Um, and so they brought me sort of content that was pro-American, that was pro um, our values and principles. Uh, and so those are the opportunities they gave me in, in the entertainment field. Um, so that was, that was the programming that they wanted to push with me. That's the, the programming that was designed for me to carry. Others, have, are, others are different kinds of assets that carry um, different kinds of programming that are harmful for America. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I've never saw myself as an actor. It was always an asset. Do you think that it was programming? Because the way you're saying it makes me, makes me think that you believe it was inspired by government actors, agencies to, you know, elicit maybe a fighting force for the military. Or do you think that was just what consumers wanted to, to view, to watch, to see, and the prevailing virtues or, you know, values was something different than I think what we've seen today, which tends to migrate and deviate from that. So what was it, I guess what I'm asking, was it a product of what the market wanted or was it something on a deeper level, like the government involvement in it? No, I, I definitely believe it was, um, government involved programs. Um, you know, when you, when you see the news cycle, they control the news cycle CIA you know, they control what comes out and what they push uh, in many ways. And so I believe this was um, some three-letter agency kind of uh, program. Um, you know, it's the last words I spoke with my mother. I, I, I can't speak with my mother anymore. Uh, I'm not sure why. But the last words I spoke with her, she said to me, there's other kids in the program, Ricky, it wasn't just you. And that was the last words I got to hear from my mom. And so uh, when she told me that, it, it started to even click more and more. Um, so no, I think it was designed. 
this wasn't a just market force kind of content um, issue. Uh, it, it, this was a, a designed issue. I feel like they plant seeds in Hollywood and then they call on them when they, when they want. And when they brought me Hunter Biden's laptop and gave me this information, um, it's, what, it's what makes sense. Why else would they have brought it to me? What, you, what was I, the... Yeah. Go ahead. Why else go would ahead, they Ricky, have I think I, uh, Yeah, I think I interrupted you. So go uh, continue. Well, when you say they, who, who do you mean? Who, who is they that brought you this laptop that gave you the information that, that was on that laptop? Because it's obviously infamous now, but at the time it, it, it wasn't. And it was, uh, it was presented as a hoax, as a scam, as, as something that uh, shouldn't be looked at. Yeah, so it was brought to me from a man who said that he worked with the three-letter agencies. And when he came into the house, you know, he, he said he, does, he did work with them and he had something to share with me. And so we sat for four hours and went through Hunter's, Hunter's info and the Smartmatic election um, data. And so uh, he, he said that, that he worked for them. And so I believed him when he said he worked for them. Um, what's interesting is that I met that, that, this man one time before about 10 years earlier, uh, he came to my home with a horse trailer and I had five miniature Sicilian donkeys. I lived on a farm in Topanga, California. And he came to my home and uh, he collected those donkeys because the kids weren't playing with them anymore. And um, he took those donkeys away and I you know, had a nice conversation with him. And then 10 years later, he shows up at my house with Hunter's info. And so I realized then that that, that wasn't that, that perhaps that there that wasn't just a coincidence that, that ten years earlier he'd come to my house and took taken those donkeys away. And did you sell the donkeys? Is that and he bought those or well, how did that like how did that come to be? Yeah, we had five Sicilian miniature donkeys. They're the coolest pets, and um, the kids were getting older and they weren't giving them the attention they needed and wanted, and so we were going to give them to a family. And so I, I went uh, to the local coffee shop in Topanga and I asked the lady that worked there, do you know anybody wants these miniature donkeys? And she said, I might. And so this, this fella came over with a horse trailer and we visited for an hour and he took them. He said he had some kids that wanted them. And, uh, and then I never saw him again until he came to my house with Hunter Biden's laptop a decade later. And, and what was the request? So he shows you this, this laptop. Was there, was there some sort of request or, or where did it go from there? It, it was, um, I'm going to give you this information and you can share it or not. But I thought you should know it. And so. And that's it. Yeah, there was no pressure. There was no force. I spent a long time in prayer deciding what I was going to do about this information that I had. You know, I, 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 I knew my life would change when I started posting Hunter's contracts. Um, but I decided that I couldn't validate the data or information, and it wasn't necessarily my job to validate it. But it was, I felt a responsibility to push it along and to push it out to who I could. And how, and how have things changed for you now since, since, since that day and since you have shared and, and become more vocal about some of this stuff? My life's pretty good. I, I've, I've, I love Colorado. I'm back here on my, my farm. And, um, you know, Hollywood is, has rejected me, most of mainstream Hollywood, I'm sure, because of my, what I've been doing and saying. And, but, um, but I was never accepted anyway, so... That, uh, that, that didn't make me too upset. But I did want to start a, I still want to tell stories and documentaries and films. So that's hence the idea I got into Real American Heroes um, Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And so its mission is to, you know, to counteract the programming coming out of Hollywood. And so we're going to tell long form stories and documentaries. And what I want to build for America is kind of a patriot PBS, an alternative 
where you can get your money out of Hollywood and we can aggregate great stories and bring them to the, to the world and to the country. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, uh, who's responsible for the Oscars, they had uh, DEI requirements a few years ago. That doesn't, uh, I'm not aware of that, but that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and so their requirements now say for best picture category. Oh, I did know to, about this. Keep going. I did know about this. Yeah, you have to have lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender storylines and themes and characters and even crew to work on the films to be eligible for the best picture category. So I'm insulted by my industry. I'm insulted by my academy that, you know, people, gold star families whose kids go out there and put on a uniform uh, and, and sacrifice their lives, you know, their stories aren't eligible for the highest award in our land, the Oscar for best picture. Saving Private Ryan wouldn't be eligible for best picture today because of the DEI requirements for the best picture category. And so it's completely insulting. Hollywood's fallen. You know, they have, they have false idols. American Idol, you know, it, it tells us in the Bible just so you know not to chase idols. And then you look at the biggest shows on TV and they use those words. Or Survivor, everybody wants to, what do they want to win? The idol, you know, mm. to, to save themselves. And so the, idol, the Bible warns us old, multiple times, stay away from idols. And that's what Hollywood's about, is idols. And so it's, it's uh, it, hence Real American Heroes Foundation. We have a great story to tell about the Battle of Wanat uh, in Afghanistan. That's uh, a compelling story. We have a great story about a Navy SEAL who uh, swam, swam 2,400 miles down the Mississippi River in six months, one mile for every KIA in Afghanistan. His name is Chris Ring. We want to tell. And so our mission is to counteract that programming that Hollywood's pushing out. We want to build yeah, Patriot PBS. Patriot PBS. Yeah, I like that. I, you know, I'm, I just wrote a couple of movie titles down because I, I think there is a, a, I hate to say it this way when you're talking about gold star families, you know, I served in the military and so I have a familiarity with this, but so I, I hate to say that there's a, a market for it. That's not the right way to say it, but it'll do for now. But you think about movies like American Sniper or Lone Survivor, which are obviously mainstream, you know, juggernauts in the movie industry. And I think there is really a craving for uh, American values, American virtues, good heroic stories of, of people doing heroic and, and difficult and challenging things. Do you think that's changed over the past, you know, 30, 40 years? And if so, what has instigated that change in Hollywood? Well, there is a market for it. You're absolutely right. P people want to hear and see good stories with characters that have morals and values and do the right thing. Um, Hollywood got into the telling the, the stories of the, the anti-heroes uh, and, and flawed characters. And um, so there is definitely a market for it. What's changed? Oh, goodness. I mean, we're, we're losing our, our principles and values, in my opinion, as, as, a, as a nation. Uh, we're trying to rewrite history. We're trying to change history in real time. You've read 1984, right? Right, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we see it happening sort of in front of us um, in real time. So um, what's changed? I mean, I, money, greed, chasing idols, you know, putting self before country. Hollywood has... You know, it's declining. It's just a, it's just showing what society is, you know, and it's 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 a declining cultural rot happening. Um, and it starts, in my opinion, with 40 years of Internet pornography being pushed into our society and into our minds, into our souls and to our homes. So the Council on Porn Pornography Reform, um, we started producing a series called Erotic Erosion that looks at the disastrous effects. When they moved pornography uh, out of the .xxx URL, they shut it down and they put, mm -hmm. it into the dot, they put it into the .com world intentionally. Um, it became almost impossible for, for families to, to stop it from coming into their homes. 
Uh, you couldn't block. When it was in .xxx, which is one of our goals, is to move it all back to .xxx, uh, it was controllable. It was, it was uh, manageable. You could put a blocker at your house and block anything from that URL, .xxx. Once they go into the .com world, you, you couldn't. It was like whack-a-mole for parents. Mm. Uh, so I think Internet pornography being pushed into our society for 40 years um, has had disastrous effects on our culture, um, and it needs to change. And so we, we believe we have some ideas on how to change it. Um, we want an off switch, Ryan. If you pay the bill for Verizon or AT&T, um, adult content should be swapped off. If you want it off to your phone and sub accounts to your kids, and you should have that right. You and I both know there's no pornography. Like you went to Afghanistan, I'm sure. Um, I was in Iraq. Was there pornography on the internet in Iraq? Uh, not remember? that I know of. I mean, I had very limited access to the internet, but uh, not that I know of. <laughs> well, in Afghanistan, when I was there, there was no internet pornography available. Um, you know, everybody had flash drives and they would pass them around the soldiers, but there was no such thing as internet pornography. And so they have the capability, even Montana right now, you can, tr they've turned off Pornhub, turned off their site to all zip codes in Montana. So they have the ability to turn off pornography per zip code, per state, per nation. And so we're not, we're not advocating for them to ban pornography at this time. But we are advocating for them to um, give us the choice. You know, if we pay the bill to AT&T or Verizon, there's no reason we should have that stuff pushed to our, our homes and our phones. Um, I think the argument, and, and you and I talked about this briefly before we hit record, but the argument you often hear is pornography is protected by the First Amendment, right? And you had sent me an article, and I, admittedly I have not had the chance to read it, but you had sent me an article before we started um, that, that illustrates or communicates that uh, pornography is not uh, protected by the First Amendment, according to the, the individuals who wrote the article. That's correct. I mean... Um they changed the definition. So freedom of speech and freedom of press, the First Amendment, were created by our forefathers before electricity was created, before the camera was invented. And if you think about this perversion and pornography, it all came with the invention of the camera. Before the camera, you couldn't um, capture an image. You could engage in perversion or you could witness perversion, but you couldn't distribute it. But 150 mm. years ago, they took the first pictures of the porn. And for 150 years now, they've been disseminating it and distributing it uh, in, into our culture. And they never had the right. The First Amendment protected speech. But the court, the Supreme Court, redefined freedom of speech to be freedom of expression. And, and, and photographs were covered then under freedom of expression. Freedom of speech only had to do with fighting back against the powers of the government. You could say what you wanted without being in fear of being thrown in the gulag or whatever. Sure. Um, but freedom of expression is how the courts have redefined um, the First Amendment. And they, they include, I was talking to you know, a lawyer today in D.C. and the absurdity of the debate we had was they were talking about how um, child erotica content is different than child pornography content. And that there is a, a difference between child erotica and child pornography. And it's, that's where we're at. That's the absurdity of, you know, all of that is bad. There should be no child erotica kind of content or child pornography content, but that's what the lawyers do. They, 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 they look for the gray areas and they, they, they try to, you know, they're destroying, so many of them are destroying our standards and values because there should be no definition between child erotica or child pornography. Child erotica leads to child pornography. They're, they're, I mean, what is the, I don't even, what is, what, what is their claim that is the distinction? If somebody posts a picture of a nude child online, but it's not in a sexual content, context, it's them um, playing, swimming in a creek, and it's, their family is a bunch of nudists, and they should be able to post that 
because it's not pornography. It's erotic, but it's not pornography. Hmm, okay. And so, yeah, there's no sexual act involved. And so they want to define literally the difference between erotica and pornography. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's things like even, even that, you know, that I hear that, but there's also things like, and you see this popping up more and more, which is, uh, you know, pedophilia is a, uh, a sexual orientation is the big push now, right? So we're not going to discriminate against those who are, are quote unquote predisposed or engage in pedophilia because it's simply a sexual orientation, uh, not something perverted per se. Yeah. And, and there, I've also heard the argument that they may never act out on it. It's just their, it's just the, what, what they masturbate to, you know, it's just what, which they is an action. To. I mean, that's, that, that's an action. It, absolutely. And it's not a victimless crime because these people then walk in society amongst us, amongst my children and yours and our girlfriends or wives. And, you know, we're, we're dealing with all this perversion that they never had the right to push into us using the first amendment. And so we, we need to go back to English common law and decency. Um, and so that's what, that's what the paper is I, I sent you. Um, I'm what does uh, English common law suggest? I, I'm not familiar with it in, in this context. Well, English common law, you know, nude dancing was, was illegal in, in England. Um, you know, there's, there's just basic norms of behavior that are defined as English common law. It's, we all know that it's what normal, healthy humans behave like. And anything outside of that is against English common law. And we have strayed so far from the foundation. All the colonies were, uh, had English common law prior to uh, Declaration of Independence. They were, they were all built upon English common law for decency and, and the way people behave and treat each other. And... Um, and we have strayed from English common law. Um, you know, so we're in trouble, I mean, with this perversion unless we get a handle on it. And, you know, it's getting worse. You look at the, the transgender confusion and the, the rise of the sexual confusion in our nation with, with those issues. I, I believe that's all a result of 40 years of internet pornography being really pushed into our minds and our, our souls and the way we see ourselves and the confusion that comes with that. And so what, what, here's an interesting thing you might find interesting. Um, you know about dry counties in the South where they have so, served no alcohol? Sure, of course, yeah. So I'm talking to a county here in the West that's interested in becoming a porn-free dry county. And so we're, we're going to actually be heading over to the, speak with their county commissioners. And uh, they're p possibly going to put the vote uh, before the members of their county, which is a tiny county, uh, less than 5,000 people. And um, devout, um, love America, um, love Jesus. And there's a good chance that this will pass in this county, that they will become the first porn-free county, dry county in our nation. And obviously, a lot of uh, issues will come with that. The, the porn producers and pushers will fight it in the, law, in the courts. But, but we the people, I mean, what about what we want? If that county doesn't want pornography in their zip codes and they vote on it and a majority decide that, um, it's an interesting question. Shouldn't they have the right to, like a dry county, be porn-free? Yeah, I mean... Sure. And, and, you know, the opportunity to leave or find another place if you so desire is, is yours, you know, and, and I, I think that's even a, a, a more viable opportunity than it's ever been, you know, for us to move. And, the, and this is why we see, you know, people moving, for example, out of California to uh, Florida or Texas, you know, because they're not interested in the politics and the in the laws and the rules and the regulations that allow this this perversion and degeneracy. Yeah, and I think the county is where we have to fight it. And if we, can, if we can get this one county to vote and pass it, imagine if there's thousands of counties that, that wanted to be porn free and they had a vote. And, um, you know, they, they can't defeat us all. They can't stop us all. 
Yeah, I think the biggest issue is, you know, what, what two consenting adults do inside the walls of their home or their bedroom is, you know, entirely up to them, by all means, whatever, whatever you think. Uh, it's when you involve other people, especially minors, right? Because they don't have a say. They don't have any authority over their own lives in a lot of ways. Uh, and then to your point earlier about the distribution, you know, now you're distributing it. You know, we, we don't allow people to, well, we do allow, but there is laws that says we can't, uh, uh, distribute drugs, for example, because we know of the harmful effects on right. those individuals who even decide voluntarily to in, engage in drug use. And we st- still criminal activity. So I think there is a case to be made for uh, making certain distribution of, of certain materials I- illegal on, on those basis. That, that's not a precedent that hasn't been set already. Well, porn is a drug. I mean, I, we, uh, in erotic erosion, we talked with uh, a counselor, Clint Davis, who's who explained to us and Dr. Amen from the Brain Clinic, we're going to be speaking with him, that cocaine has the same effects as masturbating to pornography on the young boy's brain. It's that large of a dopamine hit and that serotonin dump. And so it becomes like a habit, um, pornography. And so, you know, if you had a drug habit, you wouldn't, if every day a drug dealer put drugs at your front door and you had to choose whether or not to go get them as, as the addict, it's the same thing they're doing with pornography because it is a drug and they're pushing it to our phones and to our houses and putting the choice on us whether or not we pick it up. Well, how about we just don't have the choice for the ones that don't want the choice, the ones that don't want it delivered to their house or their phone, just off. And that's, that's what we're advocating for um, is an off switch. If you want to keep it out there on, on the rest of the America, go ahead. But why should, why should we be forced to have it pushed to our homes, you know? Yeah, and I imagine there'll be providers, if this picks up traction and steam the way I think it can, I, I imagine there will be alternative providers who have these types of options, um, th- th- you know, where it won't be viable or accessible. And I think that would be a good thing. What's the biggest, what's the biggest hurdle that you run up against, whether it's from the, the, the porn industry or you know, other industries and agencies to the consumer themselves. What is the biggest hang up in the types of uh, legislation and regulation that you're talking about? Well, Washington's cumbersome and broken. And there are five bills right now that, you know, Congress and senators are working on that that do help, but they don't go far enough. They deal with, you know, the consequences of, of the sickness and perversion and the disease of, of pornography. They don't go at the root problem. Um, and so, our, our, you know, we're trying to circumnavigate that as best we can. I have a, a law firm that's writing legislation on the two key issues that we really are pushing, which is um, putting .xxx back into the um, the that all adult content back into the .xxx URL and an off switch for people to pay the bill. So we're, we're going to develop the legislation in-house and we'll get it, you know, about 80% written. And then it'll be go- taken to the legislative council office. Um, I spoke with a senator's uh, office today. Um, and so, you know, I'll have to get co-sponsors. Um, so that's what we're trying to do is just circumnavigate their slow, tedious process in D.C. and get our own legislation written and then bring that to the people and share it with America. Like this is the two things we want. Um, and, and I think people just haven't thought that it's possible. They've been conditioned so long to believe that pornography is covered by the First Amendment that they don't even think it's possible. But it is possible. And we can change this and we must change this. And so um, it's just getting people to believe we can change this um, it has been sort of and educating people that it's possible um, is, is sort of where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, on an intuitive level, if you just spend any time in thinking about it, and it which admittedly I haven't from a from a First Amendment perspective, uh, but there's a lot of expression that is illegal, <laughs> you know, it, not right. everything is protected. Even if you choose to look at it from the freedom of expression, you know, you can't, you can't go murder somebody. 
You can't sell yes. an individual illegal drugs. Like these are all, these could all be argued that they're a freedom of expression. Well, I don't like that guy. So I'm going to go kill him. Is that a freedom yeah. of expression? You could make the case it is, but yet we as a society don't allow that for obvious reasons. It's not far fetched to assume that this would fall into that same camp. Completely agree. Um, freedom of expression is nowhere in the constitution. It's not written those words. But 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 uh, and, and that's what the courts have have determined um, pornography is that it's freedom of expression. Um, it was never covered by the First Amendment, um, and we need to unwind, you know, their 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 disastrous effects. Um, you know, young young men growing up watching pornography, they see the world differently, they see women differently, they interact with the world differently. They're they're have much more sort of it seems like serious emotional, uh, antisocial, uh, aggressive tendencies. Um, this has you know regardless of the the implications on your soul, it has a biological. It has a biological impact uh, on on how young men behave, uh, how they treat women. Um, you know I saw my first pornography when I was nine years old, the first video. And uh, it's, it's something that I'll never forget, uh, the image. And it, and it opened up a curiosity which only, um, which only hurt my development and hurt my, my soul. It, it did nothing ever to help me. And, um, you know, and there's too many kids right now that are playing video games and watching porn for hours a day. Um, and... Uh, you know, the parents, 87% of parents, according to uh, Clint, my, one of the interviewees on erotic erosion, 87% of parents have no guidelines for their children's social media use. Hmm. 87%. And so the, it, it's wide open for them out there, these kids, and what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, um, the hardcore nature. Um, the perversion escalates, it doesn't stay at level two, it goes to level 10. Um, it turns into bestiality and furries. You know, it turns into that whole, you know, perverted kind of, that's where, besti that's where furries go, in my opinion. It's, you know, it, there's an animal component to it, uh, the pretending to be animals, uh, pretending to be cats, going to the bathroom in litter boxes and, you know, there's a whole uh, perverse, perverse side to the, fur, to the furry movement. People think it's cute, but Disney put out the first furries. Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, they were the goofy, Donald Duck. Disney created that whole furry culture, in my opinion. Well, and it only gets worse. I mean, not, not, not to mention what you're talking about, but you think about the advent of AI and, and what that's going to do, because I mean, obviously that's going to infiltrate, and it already has, the um, pornography industry, uh, and then robotics. And you start coupling these things together. I mean, talk about a society that doesn't want to engage with anybody else. Why, why would you? You know, you can have a quote unquote woman to your spe specifications uh, anytime you want. Uh, you don't need to go out there and engage with society. And um, it just becomes this, you know, crazy dystopian society where we're just boxed in, you know, uh, succumbing to every wish and desire that, that we've ever imagined and plenty that we haven't yet. Well, they're trying to break the family and the, and the bond between man and woman, the biblical bond between man and woman. I mean, let's talk about women for a sec and vibrators. You know, that is a barrier between intimacy and bonding between a man and a woman. If you plug it into the outlet, you, you put that alien device at 10,000 RPMs on your groin, and then you fantasize, perhaps if you're alone, about who knows what. You know, some other relationships you had, previous relationships. Maybe you're fantasizing about your current partner, maybe not. But you're, you're sort of self-gratifying yourself in this men watching pornography, watching women, other women masturbating to them. So when they do hook up with their, their partner in earth, in, on the world, in the world, you know, where are their minds? You've just looked at 25 hours of porn the previous week or whatever the hell it was, and now you're with your significant other trying to get her to perform like 
the 25 hours of porn you watched. It's like, it's breaking the, the bond. And so it's, it's really a matter of clearing, you got to clear yourself in a sense, like your soul and get these intrusive thoughts out of your mind. You know, if, 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 you've, if you've got intrusive thoughts for men and women and anything that breaks that bond, including the vibrator, including pornography, has got to be thrown in the trash so that, you know, you and your, your wife or me and my wife can have that bond that's so special and sacred and only belongs to the two of you. And that's what makes marriage special. That's what makes your relationship special. It belongs to you. You're not out there thinking and fantasizing about other women, and she's not fantasizing about other guys. Um, but that's what conditions, that's what's conditioned us. They, the society, the programming, you know, is conditioned so much, you know, don't have kids, don't get married, don't have a biblical kind of marriage. The conditioning is anti that. Well, why did this become such an issue for you with what you're doing it with, with regards to addressing pornography and then also with uh, Real American Heroes Foundation? Why did you feel like you wanted to become the champion of these two causes in particular? Well, the, the perversion that, I, you know, that I've seen and I was around, I, I was around it as a kid. You know, I was, I was, um, I was around pedophiles as a child. I mean, I, they, they worked around me, they, they, they had jobs around my career, they were involved. And so I, I saw, like, I saw it, for, I saw it a, a lot. Um, those magazines that we were, I was in when I was a teenager, um, Teen Beat, remember that magazine? Sure, yeah. It was, all, it was all pedophiles that produced it, shot the pictures, and Teen Beat meant this, mm. you know, it, that that's what it was and um i saw people die i saw people overdose but from their from their trauma of being molested and being you know used as a sexual gratification for perverted men and i saw people you know take their lives over that stuff um so you know i just don't want this i want this world to get a little better i want these little ones to have a better chance and you know, uh, perversion is, is it's, it's like a fire, a fire, and the more fuel you put on it, the bigger it grows. And so, you know, pornography is one of the biggest, I think, uh, fuels for the abuse. Um, I've seen it happen in, in many families, destroyed, marriages destroyed, um, relationships destroyed because of it. And... Uh, it doesn't have to stay this way. It, it can't stay this way. We, we've got to put it back in the .xxx pipe. Whoever wants it can find it there. And we have to give the choice to people to turn it off. They have no rights to push it to us. Like, it is a drug. Hmm. Well, you're doing powerful work. I, I'd love for you to share uh, with the guys where to go to connect more on, on both these fronts and learn more about what you're doing, including supporting your work. Where, where can I send them? Yeah, so uh, realamericanheroesfoundation.org. You can see the projects we have in development. Uh, we got some great war stories uh, we're going to tell. Um, and then the council on pornreform.org. You can learn about our mission there and our goals. Um, we have some papers there about the First Amendment, how it never covered pornography. Uh, we also have a pledge if you want to join uh, CPR, pledge.org, Council on Porn Reform, pledge.org. Um, you can sign up and do a porn-free pledge, and you can sign it and put it on your fridge, uh, and you can get resources there about uh, how to overcome this, uh, this, this, this problem. It's overcomable. You know, I've been porn free now uh, several years. Um, feels great. Uh, I haven't always struggled with porn. There's been periods in my life where it came and, and went. Um, but I know the darkest periods of my life is when it was present. And, um, and so, um, Real American Heroes Foundation, um, that's, our, that's our mission. Excellent.
Well, Ricky, we'll sync everything up. Keep up the great work. It's such an honor to talk with you. And I love when, you know, we, we, we as men, a lot of the times can recognize some of the problems. You know, we see it. We see what's going on. We get frustrated with it. Um, and, but very, very, too, I'll say it this way, too few of us do anything about it. And I'm glad that you are doing something about it. I'm excited to support you and to be able to share this message because it is one that needs to be heard. So thanks for joining me today and sharing a little bit about what you're doing. Thanks, Ryan, man. God bless. Thank you, brother.